<laughs> yeah. No, yeah, they asked me questions like, have you ever crashed a plane before? Is this your first and, like, time? All the doctors on the cruise ship were just like, you just survived a plane crash. Like, you sure you're fine? It was my one time on a cruise and hopefully my last that I drop in on. So, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm Lou Morton from Seattle, Washington. I work for a company that's based out of Seattle, Washington, the Flight Academy. Uh, what we do is we specialize in flight training, ferry flying as well. The ferry flying, I mean, I mean, it's definitely been recognized as some of the most dangerous flying out there. The technical definition of ferry flying is just moving a plane for someone else from point A to point B. Uh, I get international deliveries all over the place. I'm on my second passport at the age of 25. Everything's looking good. I mean, I was going to have a nice tailwind. When you're finally over the water, you're just you're just looking at all this blue below you. You kind of look at your engine page and you see one little thing fluctuate and you're staring at it for two hours. But now when we do sort of Pacific operations, there still is a point where we call it the point of no return. My aft fuel tank um, had about 70 gallons or so sitting in the back of it. Uh, when I opened up the transfer valve, I was about 900 miles from Hawaii and about 1,200 miles away from California. So I was already past my point of no return. Now I'm dedicated. There's something there, there's something that's stopping this flow, there's something going on. The only thing I could do is now I've just declared an emergency for November 7 Yankee Tango. I'm having an issue with my fuel system that's not transferring. Is there any like way you guys can prepare like either a C-130 or a Hilo? They're like, yeah, we can do both. I was like, that sounds great. And that was the most reassuring thing when that happened, to have that C-130 sitting off your left wing and falling you all the way in. So once I fully drained out the forward auxiliary tank to the wings, now I know that exact number, how much fuel I have left. And unfortunately, it's gonna put me about 200 miles short of Hawaii. And then it came the time of knowing that you're gonna to have to ditch an aircraft, so I had two options. You can still continue going straight for Hawaii and, and hope you make it 130 to 135 miles and then get picked up by a helo. Or there's this cruise ship that you could also try for that's 275 miles off of Hawaii. But the other thing is that you have to then go and find this cruise ship over the middle of the ocean that we're just giving you coordinates to and it's traveling on this heading going this fast. There was airliners chiming in of like, oh, so V-line it for Hawaii as best as you can and you'll probably make it a little bit further. And there's another guy that was like, hey, if I was you, I'd just go for the cruise ship. Everyone's given their opinions and it was, everybody would kind of finish up with their little bit of, but uh, I mean, it's, it's really, it's your decision of what you're gonna do. At that point, I'd already made the decision to try and find this cruise ship. I gave my dad a call on the sat phone. Hey, there's a Coast Guard C-130 off my left wing. And his reply was, okay, explain. Explain to him, all right, I'm going to go find this cruise ship. I'm going to be pulling the parachute for ditching the aircraft there. He kind of explained to me, he's like, he's like, I think you're kind of the perfect person to have this happen to. So just instilled kind of a good amount of confidence uh, for me to have for myself. I mean, the typical end of a phone call conversation, at least for me and my parents, is like, all right, I love you, I'll talk to you later. And it's just kind of like, all right, love you, hopefully I can talk to you later. It's ingrained in the head of you've got this parachute system. I never, it never really crossed my mind to really do a ditching. You don't want to take a fixed gear aircraft and try and plow it onto the water. It's more of you get this straight down impact and you have a very much higher potential that you're actually going to walk away from it or swim away depending upon what you're going into. When I found the cruise ship and was circling him, I'm looking down at the water, it's about 12 to 15 foot swells. I want to go beyond the bow so they can keep an eye on me. And they're like, that's what he, exactly what he wants you to do. You have this moment of just sort of realization of, of what you're going to be doing and getting yourself ready for the next step. And you kind of feel like a five-year-old kid at the end of the high dive. Turn the fuel selector to the off position, pulling the power back, which is weird, and pulling that mixture all the way back to idle cutoff. Now it's reach up and uh, you get your hand on the parachute handle. That's when I decided to go ahead and deploy the parachute. 
And then you hear that first rocket just fire right out. So you hear the loud bang and the pop of the panel on the backside. Uh, then what happens is you get that the acceleration, the parachute actually pulling on the plane, so it kind of pulls you back into your seat. What happens next is that whole pitch change. The actual aircraft then pitches down. Then you hear the huge the, the crackling of the straps and the sides that finally come out and just the aircraft then just does this pitch up and levels out. The prop is no longer windmilling and the whole thing is just dead quiet. Just sort of the surreal moment of just quietness in this plane as I'm still in the air. Um, it was about two to three minutes before I impacted the water. Once I saw that water coming closer and closer, it was, it's a pretty aggressive impact. If you slow down in that video, you can kind of see me from the Coast Guard clip of me jumping over the fuselage as it starts to swing over. Still, I was about another hour until the lifeboat came out to me. And they luckily found me pretty quickly and easily. They were like interested by what was happening. They were like, what kind of plane was that? Like, was it you under the parachute or was it the plane or what was like? I mean, even people on the cruise ship that were like, yeah, we saw you under the parachute. And I was like, no, it was the whole plane. And they were like, no. And I was like, you saw this with your own eyes. <laughs> The Cirrus Caps parachute system, uh, what it did for me for that day was allow me to live through the whole day. I mean, I've got over 2,000 hours in the Cirrus aircraft. I mean, they're definitely one of my favorite planes to fly. And I can't thank them enough for designing an aircraft that they say, hey, we're gonna make a parachute system standard. And it's always like a, a funny conversation to have with another pilot and be like, now are you actually gonna do that? And there's a lot of pilots that are like, well, maybe, I don't know, and I'm like, that cap system isn't just for you. It's everybody else that's worried about you going flying. It's this whole decision making that we're trying to change around with a lot of pilots. Like you have the system that's gonna save your life and that's exactly what that system did for me just as designed. Use it. <laughs>